This past Thursday was Groundhog's Day, and it's a day whenever we take um, a weather forecast from a, a rodent that resides on the other side of the state. And just in case you didn't hear the news, Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow, which means another six weeks of winter. But what you might not know is that I also saw my shadow on that day, which means six more weeks of this sermon series. <laughs> not completely true. Lent does begin in, in three weeks, so at least three more weeks of this sermon series. All right, we've been talking about comebacks since the new year. This idea that at this time of the year in particular, it seems like everyone is trying to institute some changes that maybe, just maybe, we've been noticing for year after year after year. But there's something about the new year that makes us want to make those changes. And guess what? If you feel like God is leading you to make those changes, then I want you to make them as well. But what we find whenever we try to make a comeback is that they're pretty challenging. So that's why we're spending uh, this time to talk about what comebacks actually require. What we've got to note first, and what we've been talking about over the past few weeks, is that comebacks begin with desire. They begin with, with, with this burning desire inside of us to actually do something about the problems that we see. Soon after we've gained that desire, comebacks require a recognition of reality. And what is that reality? That we've got a part to play in this. That we can't blame everyone else for the changes that we need to make in our lives if unless we've truly been made a victim, unless we've been a victim of the three big A's, and I don't mean AAA, whatever that stands for, probably like American Automobile Association, just taking a guess, but what I'm talking about is unless we've been the victim of abuse or addiction or adultery, then we are at least a part of the problem. And we need to acknowledge this before we can do anything else. Once we've made that acknowledgement, we often find that uh, the comeback journey is going to be pretty steep. And we realize that comebacks require help. If we are part of the problem, then we probably don't contain our own solutions. And so we need to seek out outside help. We need to seek help from God. We need to seek help from other people that God has created. We just need to get some help. But then once we've started to get that help, we realize just how challenging this journey is going to be. It's going to consist of trying and failing and trying and failing. And so comebacks require persistence. They require us to be able to get knocked down, but to get back up again, to fail, but to be willing to try again, to have that level of perseverance. All right, so maybe you're in that process Maybe you're starting your comeback journey. Maybe you're getting some help. Maybe you're even persevering through the challenges that are ahead of you. Well, once you get to that place and you're wondering if you're truly on the journey, then we've got to acknowledge that comebacks require signs of genuine change. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Oftentimes, we're going to need to prove it to other people. Oftentimes, we're, we're going to need to show that we are actually making the changes that we know that we need to make in our lives. And to illustrate this point, today we're going to be looking at the story of probably the most changed person in the entire Bible. And that individual is Paul. Paul. We're going to read his introductory story in just a, just a moment, but, but before we can get to his introduction in Scripture, I just want to call your attention to a few matters. Number one, this is going to be the first time that Paul is ever going to be mentioned in Scripture. Number two, he's actually going to be referred to as Saul. It's the same exact person, so whenever you see Saul, also think Paul. And number three, this interaction is going to be in the context of another man named Stephen who has been talking about Jesus. So let's read Paul's introduction in Scripture. At this, they shrieked 
and covered their ears. Together they charged at him, threw him out of the city, and began to stone him. The witnesses placed their their coats in the care of a young man named Saul. As they battered him with stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, accept my life. Falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Then he died. Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. At that time, the church in Jerusalem began to be subjected to vicious harassment. Everyone, except the apostles, was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some pious men buried Stephen and deeply grieved over him. Saul began to wreak havoc against the church, entering one house after another. He would drag off both men and women and throw them into prison. So a few things that we need to note from Saul's introduction in Scripture is that, number one, he took place in the murder of the very first Christian martyr named Stephen. He had an albeit small role, but nonetheless, he played a part. And what's more than that, we actually read that he was in full agreement of what was going on. Finally, emboldened by this act, Saul makes this his mission. He sets out to, to, to do more of that to to bring more persecution against the people who were just trying to follow Jesus. The next time that we read about Saul in Scripture, it's going to be some more of the same, but you're going to see a change happen in the next time that Saul is talked about. And so I asked our friend Jim to read us the story of Paul's change, which is recorded in Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged in the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. Those traveling with him stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they saw no one. After they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes but he couldn't see. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and neither ate nor drank anything. In Damascus, there was a certain disciple named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, yes, Lord. The Lord instructed him, go to Judah's house on State Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with authority from the chief priests to arrest everyone who calls on your name. The Lord replied, Go. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Ananias went to the house. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here, he sent me so that you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, flakes fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After eating, he regained his strength. He stayed with the disciples in Damascus for several days. Right away, he began to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. He is God's son, he declared. 
Everyone who heard him was baffled. They questioned each other. Isn't he the one who was wreaking havoc among those in Jerusalem who called on this name? Hadn't he come here to take those same people as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and stronger. He confused the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After this had gone on for some time, the Jews hatched a plot to kill Saul. However, he found out about their scheme. They were keeping watch at the city gates around the clock so they could assassinate him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. They didn't believe he was really a disciple. Then Barnabas brought Saul to the apostles and told them the story about how Saul saw the Lord on the way and that the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them about the confidence with which Saul had preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. After this, Saul moved freely among the disciples in Jerusalem and was speaking with confidence in the name of the Lord. He got into debates with the Greek-speaking Jews as well, but they tried to kill him. When the family of believers learned about this, they escorted him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Paul experienced a radical change as a result of meeting Jesus. And this change that Paul underwent simply confounded everyone. He goes from from those that he was conspiring with, all of a sudden they don't know what to make of this, and the people that he had been persecuting don't trust him because they witnessed all of the terrible things that he had been doing before he met Jesus. By the way, in terms of Saul's story, it would be very nice if he went from Saul to Paul. That makes a really nice story, but it's simply not quite accurate. You see, he's still called Saul many times after this story of his conversion. He just had two names, Saul, his Hebrew name, and, and, and Paul, his, uh, his Greek name. Um, in terms of your own comeback, people will be rightfully skeptical of you. They will remember who you were. They will remember all of those things that you've done, and they will want to hold you accountable, which is only fair. Because if you've done those things, and if you've been that person in the past, then you're going to have to earn their trust again. It reminds me of something that, that John the Baptist says whenever he's preparing the way for Jesus. He said, produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. In some other translations, it's, it's bear fruit worthy of repentance. You see, repentance is, it is not simply saying we're sorry. Repentance is not simply saying that things will be different in the future, but rather repentance is truly changing our hearts and and our lives. It's changing both our inner feelings and also it's changing our outer actions. You see, you can't say that you've made a comeback without actually making a comeback. I know that that seems very obvious, but without changing your hearts and your lives, any sort of comeback that you're claiming is simply meaningless. People are going to want you to prove it. People are going to want you to show by your actions that you've actually changed. And by the way, you can change. And if you don't think you can, (laughs) just wait until you hear these stories. See, God's people, uh, we're on this journey from slavery in Egypt to to freedom in the promised land. And along that journey, uh, Moses ascended up a mountain, taught to receive the law from God, but but then a problem entered in. You see, Moses was taking just, just a little bit too long to come back down from that mountain. And so what's the most natural reaction whenever we become impatient? Well, it's to take off all of our gold jewelry and to melt it down into a cow, of course. And so that's exactly what the people 
did with their impatience. So Moses was upset about this. God was even more upset about this. In fact, God even threatened to destroy the people and to start a a, a new nation with Moses. That's when we read this. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible thing he said he would do to his people. God changed God's mind. Makes you wonder about, uh, about that whole flood with Noah. Maybe if Noah was a little bit more persuasive, that whole, that whole flood wouldn't have happened. That's probably a, another thought for another day. But, but speaking of water, um, Jonah. Jonah was someone who was sent to go and to speak to the people of Nineveh because God was going to destroy them. But, but God sent Jonah as a way of saying, if you don't change, God is going to destroy you. Well, guess what? Jonah didn't want to go, and he, so he spent some, uh, some time um, getting convinced in, in the water that he should, in fact, actually go. And he does end up going, and uh, guess what? Reluctant as he might have been, he does change the people's mind. And that's when we read this. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior, so God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it. Again, God changes God's mind. And if God is allowed to change God's mind, then guess what? You're allowed to change too. You can grow. You might have to prove it to other people. They're going to want to see you show it, but you can change. Friends, all that is required to come around the Lord's table and to feast there is a recognition that we need a comeback. All it requires is a recognition that we have gone astray, but if we approach the Lord with our heart open to how we've gone astray, God welcomes us in with open arms. So as we prepare ourselves for this, let's confess our sin before God and each other with a confession that's both in your bulletin and also on the screens. Merciful God, We have chosen scarcity over abundance. We have participated in destructive patterns. We have settled for the status quo over transformation. We have believed the lie that there is no hope for us. Forgive us and free us to be your called and redeemed people. Amen.